here with Rick Yeager, the Mac Merck. So, Rick, what are you going to be showing off on the show today? I'm going to show people how to be a better beta tester. Can you say that three times fast? Be a better beta tester. 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 Today on The Lab. Hello and how are you? Welcome to the lab. Leo Laporte here and this is the show where we're going to help you, yes you, understand technology in all its forms, everything from computers. You know, computers is kind of like the least of it now. That's the easy That's part. That's the easy part. It's now the internet and cell phones and MP3 players and home theater. I mean, it's just expanding. When I started doing this, first started doing this, 10 years ago, and then radio 15 years ago. In your teenage years. Yes, I was a mere child. Uh, the, we were talking about Windows 3.1, DOS 5, and, there, and the internet, nobody really knew about that. And cell phones, huh? You know, those were those things you carried over your, uh, over your shoulder briefcases. in briefcases. Absolutely. So it's really changed. And one of the things, and I think, I, I, I have to think that I kind of even kind of saw this coming was that the, the the technology that was in this box has just migrated out those chips are now everywhere and that does change everything what i didn't predict is how universal internet access would be all the amazing things you could do on the internet and how the internet transforms this from just a fancy computer to a communications device and that's Absolutely. more and more what we talk about on the show today so i'm glad you're here ladies i didn't even say who this okay. is. It's Kate Abraham, ladies and gentlemen. Of course you That's know that. Okay. That's okay. I'm having a conversation with you. I haven't even said your name. Kate Abraham. <laughs> the wonderful, the talented Kate Abraham. Episode 141. Rick Yeager, we saw him a second ago with his new Clark Kent glasses. How do you like those? I do like it. That's cute, lot. isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's the new look. I like the glasses. Yeah. Uh, he's going to talk about beta testing. Now, beta testing is where you get to try software before yes. everybody else does. Yeah. And if you're good at it, you can try a lot of cool stuff. But you have to be a good beta tester. He'll show you how. <laughs> Chris Krug is back talking about, this is really interesting, open source in China, yeah. where it's taking off like crazy. He's just opened an office in Shanghai. That is cool. So exciting. They're very interested in what's going on here, and we have a lot to learn from them. There's no doubt about that. Sean Carruthers also is going to talk about streaming media. We've got a lot of, lot busy, of stuff. Busy show. Busy show. But you know what? The most important part really is the callers, and I know our next caller has been up all night. He's been up all night. All night. I know. I feel really bad for this issue. It's JP, and he is in Sydney in New South Wales, oh. and the sun apparently has just risen on his bedroom window. Well, look at it this way, JP. You got to see the sunrise. Thanks for the, thanks, thanks, uh, Kate. Hello, JP. Good morning. Good, how are you? Oh, you stayed up all night, dude. I'm so sorry, but it's so not, look at this great picture we've got from Sydney. It's wonderful to talk to you. What can I do for you today? Well, I have a MacBook Pro and a Windows laptop, and I want to share the files and printers between them. Okay. To my wireless network at home. Are you having trouble doing that? Yeah, I've been trying for months now. <laughs> That's bad. Now, I've you know, it's easier one way than the is the other way. On the on the Windows laptop, is it XP or Vista? XP. Okay. Uh, and the Macintosh is OS X. So, the the nice thing about uh, this is that OS X has built in. Uh, the technology to network with Windows as if it's another Windows machine. So Windows won't even know it's a Macintosh. But you have to turn on sharing on both sides. And uh, you have to make sure, and this is where people often get bit, that the security software you're running isn't blocking the connectivity. Sometimes in order to protect you, firewalls and security software will prevent file sharing. Uh, and, you know, that's going to keep you from doing what you want to do. Uh, is the printer on the PC or the Mac? On the Mac. Okay. Uh, a couple of things I would suggest. First of all, let's make sure that on the Mac that you have gone to the sharing control panel. I'm sure you have if you've been trying for months, and you've turned on the appropriate services. In this case, file the file sharing service should be turned on. This is Tiger. Are you using Tiger, or are you still? I mean, uh, Panth uh, Leopard, or are you still back with Tiger? Tiger. 
Tiger, yes. So it looks different in Tiger. In fact, it's a little harder in Tiger. Leopard has made this, I think, a little bit easier sharing. But essentially... I don't think we're seeing you, Leo. Well, I, well what am I supposed to do? Yeah, I think we need to mirror your machine. Mirror my machine? Oh, mirror wow. Machine. Okay. Hold on a second, JP, while we mirror my machine. I'll talk while he mirrors. You look like JP right now. Oh, there we go. All right. So the, uh, the issue is making sure that sharing, file sharing is turned on both on my machine and on your Windows machine. You've done that, right? Can you, you know, can you ping one machine to the other? Can you see the other machine's IP address? Uh, yeah, okay. You've tried that. See, what we do is we can work our way up. So if you can ping it, that's good. That means that the connection is working, the two machines are talking to one another, uh, and, you know, that, it's not a cabling issue. Um, now, file sharing is the next step up from that, and file sharing can be blocked by firewalls. My suggestion is turn off any security software you've got running on either side. One way we can uh, actually make it a little easier to print uh, to a Mac machine from Windows is to put bonjour, bonjour, on the Windows machine. Bonjour is rendezvous, a.k.a. Zero config. It is a really great way of getting, uh, uh, having this kind of stuff happen without a lot of work on the user's part. And it's safe, it's secure, and in fact, it's supported by Windows. Windows calls it zero config. Uh, Apple makes a bonjour client for Windows. I would suggest Googling bonjour for Windows and downloading and installing this on your PC. The advantage of doing that is uh, your PC now should have no trouble seeing your Mac printer because it, it, it the print as long as Bonjour is allowed on both machines, which it is by default on the Mac, the printer should just show up, and that'll make it much easier for the PC to see it and print to it. So turn put Bonjour on your PC, turn off your security software, make sure you've got file sharing turned on on both. They both have to be on the same segment. You can't have them on different switches or hubs. I, I presume that you've done that, right, JP? Disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Um, make sure you're doing that. Um, let's see. Make sure that the work group name is the same. I would just make it work group. Don't put spaces in it. Don't put uh, punctuation marks in it. Uh, those are just a few of the troubleshooting tips. There's a great site that I would recommend also called, I won't show it to you. We can't put the screen up yet, called Practically Networked. It's practicallynetworked.com. And it has some great troubleshooting advice uh, for getting networks working. But almost for sure, JP, the real issue is security software. Turn that off. Put Bonjour on, and I think things will be better. Okay? Yep. I thank you so much for staying up with us. It's great to see you. I'm glad you're watching Sydney. Yeah, I watch every day. That's wonderful. Are you a student? Yes. Yeah. What are you studying? Oh, I'm in here right now. Oh, okay. You got a ways to go then. I think you're going to be a computer geek when you uh, get out of school? Uh, no. No, this is this is too tough. <laughs> is this? I hope this hasn't discouraged you. I was gonna say, if you solve this, then you're on, well on your way. But you know, that's what can sometimes happen. You go, oh man, this is like work. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to have to do this for a living. Uh, JP, I thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day. Get, get some sleep, okay? Coming up, Rick Yeager. He's gonna show you how you can try software and hardware for free, being a beta tester, a pre-release tester, but key is you got to do a good job. We'll show you how when the lab continues. You stay right here. Welcome back to the lab. Rick Yeager is here. He is the Mac Merck at MacMerck.com, also a professional production, a print production artist. And uh, you did Mac. I didn't realize this. You started Mac Merck and it's eight years ago now. I didn't realize that either. That's a long time 1999. ago. 1999. <laughs> That's amazing. That's before the boom and bust. It is. So uh, it's a great place to go for Photoshop tutorials and lots of information. But one of the things uh, a lot of people like Rick do that's kind of cool is get in on beta tests. Yeah. What is a beta test? Beta test is when a software or sometimes a hardware developer, um, they've, they've finished their alpha test, which is the internal testing. They make sure the, the program works the way they think it works. Then they send it out to the, their customer, basically, in kind of a secret way. But not every, no. so not every customer. Not every customer. Well, the, lately they've been doing these Windows has been. Public, Microsoft has been. Public, public beta tests. Yeah. Google is always in public beta test. Yeah, well, there, there are arguments that are few, uh, 
uh, applications are out there in, in public beta tests. Without, without even uh, admitting it. Admitting yeah. it. That just means they're not completely done. But, right. So, so this they, used to be actually a little, a little more exclusive than it is right. now. Yeah. They put the software out there in the field and let people use it in real-world right. environments and see what happens. It's the best way to find these bugs. In fact, right. some people say Leopard, Apple's uh, operating system, might have done a little bit better had it been tested that thoroughly. Right. Yeah. Of course, Vista was, and see what happened with Vista. So it doesn't, you know. You, you never know. You can't tell. You never know. So, so, how, so how do we get in on these? You get in on it, well, you keep your ears open for the public beta tests. Right. Those are out there. Um, some of them are semi-private, invitation only. Those, those things, you, you get the invitations, you get in. But the way I got into it was creating a relationship with the developer. Once you're a trusted beta tester, right. they say, oh, this guy's good, it's, he'll be helpful, he'll be useful. What are the negatives of being a beta tester? Well, you're, you're dealing with semi-volatile software. I, I equate it to inviting a uh, unruly child into your house. <laughs> you know, you're bringing this child in and if you're going to do that, you're going to kind of child-proof your home. Right. You're going to make sure all the valuables are out right. of the way. Don't use it on your main machine, right. probably. And if you do use it on your main machine, you have to have a backup. You should have right. a backup anyway. Right. And don't um, do it for key work. Like, as a, as a print production artist, I'm sure people like Photoshop, Adobe, come to you and say, well, we'd like you to try the new software. But right. you might not use it on that big project. No. Because if it crashes or messes it up, your, your job's I'm, on the line. Right. And I'm also going to be sending files out. Right. If, if the program you're testing s saves uh, proprietary files, you have to send that out to someone else they who, can't doesn't, use it. Right. who doesn't have that software. You got me in on a great beta test, the Skitch beta Skitch test. Beta I, test. I bless you for that <laughs> because it is, it is, it's a very cool program for the Macintosh. It lets you do screen grabs and right. stuff. Uh, and so now I am not a good beta tester. Oh. I just use it and I go, thank you. That's great. I love it. Right. Uh, how can I be better at this? Communication is the key. You Let wanna, them know. Your, the agreement you made with the developer is that you would tell them all your experiences, good and bad, what you liked about it, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see added to right. it. Sometimes and it's features, sometimes it's bugs. Sometimes it's, when it's bugs, you want to give them crash reports, and you right. can do that through uh, the console or the activity monitor. Many times the program and, itself will have a re crash right. reporter. And one thing to note is when a program crashes, you sometimes get that, that uh, window that comes up and says, your program crashed, would right. you like to report this to Apple? Apple doesn't care. They don't? And not unless it's Apple software. Oh. If Skitch crashes and uh, you report Apple it to Apple, it's... It? <laughs> That's, That's nice. funny. They crashed. <laughs> Till Plask. Send send the uh, the crash report to Plask, which they, is the company that publishes. They, they want to know about it. Yeah. How how best should we, you report these problems? Um, we can show you in. Um, I'm going to show you in console first. Console is a program. I don't know if everybody. It's who has a Mac those, knows about the console. It's in the utilities folder. It's one of those ultra geeky, I don't know what this thing does, so let's close it before but I break something kind of. <laughs> everything that happens on the Mac is reported, is reported and logged in by here. the console. And right down at the bottom here, we've got this crash report. Look, those are all see, the crashes. You, you can crash see a that lot. Adobe Photoshop CS2 crashes a lot. You crash a lot, dude. I do. So you just select that. You can copy and paste it into a text file or just uh, paste it into the body of your email. Cool. Send it to Adobe. Let them know. This thing is driving me nuts. Very, very you know? useful. Now, on a PC, you don't have a console, but you may have other logging features. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works on a PC. Yeah. I'm, I'm a total Mac guy, but, yeah. but it comes down to communication. Any way that you can communicate, a good way is the step-by-step. -step. This is what I was doing. Right. I did this, this, and this, and then boom. The best thing is if you can reproduce the exactly. bug. If you they can get that to happen to... every time, then they, then they have everything they need right. to know they to fix it. They have to be it. able to reproduce it in order to fix it, right, right. in order to track down what caused it. Right. right. And it's, it's kind of fun trying out new software. I'm loving Skitch. Right, and you get to you get to be part of the development and and kind of and shape input. the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And when you request features, you you want to be polite. A lot of people try and manipulate the the, yell. the developer. <laughs> oh yeah, I consider this a bug they that yell. it doesn't do this. Frequently, there's a mailing list associated with these things. You get on the mailing list, and there's conversation going right. back and forth. That's a that's another way those to are, give those them are feedback. really helpful because I might say I want this program to do X. I yeah. want this feature. Yeah. When really what I should tell them is I want to be able to do this function in it. You figure out how to do it yeah, best. You tell me how yeah. to implement this yeah. based on all the other input they're getting. It's like going to the mechanic and saying this is what's wrong instead of this yeah. is the symptom. This right. is, yeah. Tell them the yeah. symptom. Tell them what you, yeah. what you thought would happen and what did happen. Yeah. And 
Are you? Uh, wanna, do you beta test a lot of stuff? I I beta test. I only beta test one thing at a time because that's uh, going Another, back to the unruly child. Right. You can't tell which one broke the vase <laughs> right, if, right. if you got four or five of them <laughs> right, running around. Right. And mostly in the graphics realm, since that's your profession. Ah. Uh, I, I beta test them all. I'm, yeah. I'm a Mac geek. I'll, I I'll beta you know, it's funny them. because uh, as a journalist, and I'm covering this stuff, I don't usually do the beta tests because, uh, and, you know, if you're writing a book, you have to because you have to write the book ahead of the release right. of the product. But since I'm not on any deadlines, I don't. I like to know what the product's going to be like when it comes out, not what it might have been like right. before it came out. That sometimes can color my opinion of a product. True. Leopard, for instance, uh, but many of my friends used it before it came out. It was crashing all the time, I did. <laughs> and so I, you know, uh, they. Yeah, that colored their perception of it. Yep. Uh, meanwhile, I tried it for the first time on the day of release, and I liked it a lot right. because I hadn't seen all that Very true. pain. <laughs> we also get into the, DN the, the non-disclosure agreement. Well, and I don't well. sign those either because okay. I don't want to know anything. That I, I don't, I, 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 it comes out of my mouth. If I, so I can't remember well, what I told you. Yeah, I just it? say, it, look, if you tell me, it could come out of my mouth. So don't tell me anything you don't want me to tell anybody else. It works, I've learned, over years. MacMerc.com is Rick's site. M-A-C-M-E-R-C.com, a great place for tutorials and information like this. And, of course, we'll have a write-up on how you can become a better beta tester uh, on our website. You know what we should find out is uh, some cool beta tests are going on right now. Maybe we can put a list together or maybe find a site that has such a thing. Sure. I bet there is. Thank you, Rick. It's great to see you. Welcome. How do you like the glasses? They're good, isn't it? It's cool. It's great Clark Kent. Right. Who am I now? Oh, my gosh. It's <laughs> Superman. All right, let's get a I'll tell you what. What is this? Can you get I get I can see a gear. I can see a gear. What is this? This is something close up uh, something you'd find around the lab commonly. Do you know what it is? Hmm. We'll zoom out and find out when the lab continues stay tuned. Welcome back to the lab before the break. We asked you what the what the tech is that? Hmm. It is a gear. It is, I don't know what it is. What is it? It's, it's a the helicopter. helicopter. It's the palm-sized RC helicopter. Mm -hmm. See, we knew. Rick and I were sitting there going, it could be that clock, it could be that robot. But you didn't, you didn't give us enough information. That's not my fault. I'm not going to ask for points on that. I just want to point out, it's not my fault. <laughs> He's the guy who does it with his macro lens. Thank you, Sean. Now, Kate Abraham, I think we're going to Louisiana. We are. We're going to Huma, and we're going to speak to Donnie. Hello, Donnie. How are you today? Great, and you? It's great Thanks. to see you. In, in, is it Huma? Homa. Homa. Actually, how it's pronounced. Homa, Louisiana. <laughs> That's it. What can I do for you today? Well, Leo, I've been watching you guys for a long time. Uh, I lost you guys and felt lost when, when, when Call for Help and uh, Screensavers went off the I air. I know. And just recently, I, I found you guys again on the web when I bought an iPhone and found out what podcasting was all about. Thank you. Hallelujah. I love it. And I've been following Apple now for a while. I just got married. I'm about to have a baby in about five weeks. Congratulations. That's I'm great. Start doing a lot of photo and video, video editing. You sure are. <laughs> Switch, and I bought an iMac. Good. I think a good choice for that. I'm very happy with it. I used Mac about 20 years ago, went to the PC, and now I'm back and yeah. I'm liking it, actually. But and you could still use the PC. You could even run Windows on the Mac. But I think for what you want, the thing of, about the Mac is it comes with iPhoto, it comes with iDVD, it comes with iMovie. It's kind of made for that kind of creation. Right. right. Much easier. The problem I'm having is I have a Canon color printer, a multifunction printer. I see it behind you right there. Correct. It's a big one behind me. Yep. And you know what? I already know what you're going to say because those don't work with Mac. Right. I've talked to Canon two or three times and they don't support it, although it's their only color laser printer. They don't support it on the Mac platform. So it drives me crazy. It's because it's a multifunction. Right. And um, Canon blames Apple and Apple blames Canon. This has been going on for several years now. Um, and it's not just Canon. A number of multifunctions don't work with Apple. So, and I, I just don't know why it is. Uh, in many cases, you can get out of date or oddball printers working uh, on a Mac, not using the Mac drivers or even the manufacturer's drivers, but using something called CUPS, the common something printing system, and drivers called GIMP print. Um, in fact, if you go to gimp-print.sourceforge.net, or uh, you can find out more about it, and there's a list on here. If you go to the Guten Print webpage for OS X, there's a list here of all of the supported printers, but it does not, um, I'm sorry to say, support any multifunctions. 
because uh, it's really just a, the idea is really to support those kind of those Windows specific printers or the you know the old out of date printers that nobody's made a driver for. I mean, you see it supports a lot, but none of the multi functions. The part of the reason is it's the multi function, right? It's the fact that it's a scanner and a fax and a, a, a as well as a printer that makes it hard to support. So I'm afraid I don't have any uh, hope for you. Um, as uh, I don't think that printer will ever be supported. Look at all the printers that this supports. That's not on that list, of, even though that's, you know, this is a way that a lot of people do get uh, uh, out, out of date or weird printers working on Macs, but unfortunately in this case, it's not going to help you. I have an Epson multifunction that doesn't work either. Okay. I could print to it, but I can't use the multifunction capabilities. In, your, in the can, case of the Canon, I think you can't even print to it, right? I can't even print to it. The only thing I've come up with to work around is actually I can print the PDF right. using a Cubs driver and then drag it over to my PC and right. print from the PC a PDF document. Right. That's the three-step process. I it's a pain. It's no it. good. Yeah, I hate to have to say, to say oh, you've got to go out and get another printer. Now, you can go out and get an inexpensive inkjet. You, you probably do want to get a photo printer for your Mac anyway, right? right? So you can go out and get a, a $99 Canon, believe it or not. The Pixmas are great. Uh, that's what I use on, on, my, uh, on my Mac. And that'll print just fine. You hook it up to the Mac. But yeah, I'm afraid for... And this is a real source of frustration. I don't know who to blame. But that particular printer, I don't think it's ever going to work on, on, on OS X. And, and, you know, because this has been going on for years and, and, and nobody seems to be... It started when Tiger came out. And at, at that point, I thought, oh, it's new, It'll, they'll fix it eventually, and now we're, here we are with Leopard, no fix. Mm. I, I feel terrible to say, I, I hate to say that, JP, I, I, I wish I had some better news for you, but that's, uh, I mean, Donnie, but that's just, uh, that's, I'm, I'm going to tell you the straight truth, I don't think it's ever going to be fixed. Well, I appreciate that, and it's good talking to you. I'm and glad you found point. Cups, though, I mean, that, that is one good, good program, a good thing to know about, the Gimp Print and the Cups, gutenprint.sourceforge.net. Donnie, I'm so glad you found us. I just have to say one last thing, Leo. Your staff is terrific. Every time Kate's called me or emailed me, it's just been terrifically polite, and I just have to she's give great. her credit. She's organized. She's smart. She's beautiful. And she's got a great accent. What more could you ask for, right? Keep doing what you guys do. <laughs> Thank right? you, Donnie. I really appreciate it. We're working on getting the show down your way, too. Don't you hang in there. I think we're, gonna get, we're getting close, okay? Good. Take care. Bye-bye. Coming up in just a bit, Chris Krug is back. He is with Rain City now, and he is working with China on bringing open source and the web to the largest population in the world. We'll find out all about that, what we have to learn from China, what they have to learn from us in just a bit. But right now, it's time for our quick quiz question of the day. What did they call OS 9? Was it Sonata, Allegro, Tempo, or Leopard? <laughs> that would be funny if it were Leopard, wouldn't it? What was OS 9 called? I don't remember. Let's see if we can find out. Think about it. We'll talk about it a little later on as the lab continues. Stay right here. Welcome back to the lab. Leo Laporte here. Chris Krug is here. He uh, has been with us before as the president of Bright. Bright is now merged with Rain City Studios, right, which yeah. is great, to make one gigantic, massive web design company. That's right. Specializing in Drupal. Which is neat. We, you know, I'm a big Drupal fan, as you know, and apparently uh, so are the Chinese. It's definitely taking off over there. Open source is a, is a new thing in China. It's really um, exciting. And definitely taking off. Well, last time uh, we talked, we were uh, down in uh, Las Vegas, and uh, uh, I met you and, and uh, the guy from Robert Rain Scales. Robert, that's right, from Rain City. And Robert was about to head off to Shanghai. That's right. Um, we've opened up a, an office there in Shanghai, and he's moved there to head up our, our right? Asia operations. So. so what, how has that been? What, what is, how, do the, is it the Chinese government? Is it Chinese people? Who are you dealing with? Uh, we're dealing with, uh, well, you have to deal with the Chinese government to do right. business there, but mostly Chinese people. We've hired uh, several. Do you think the mandate's from the Chinese government or the mandate is coming from the ground? A little up? bit of the background starts with they joined the WTO a few years the ago. The World and, Trade Organization. That's right. And in order to kind of comply and be fully brought in, they need to crack down on things like software piracy, DVD piracy, copyright stuff right. in general. So that maybe so, means they like open source a little bit better, well, right? Well, all of a sudden, open source has come onto the scene because now free. free software that you can uh, control right. and participate in has become a lot more interesting. Demand. They so even have their own Linux distribution. That's right. Yeah. 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 
So uh, Drupal is, uh, you think, a tool that works well in China for the Chinese people? Oh, definitely, yeah. There's a lot of uh, PHP developers there. There's a lot of Linux folks springing up. Drupal's a new thing. Uh, DrupalChina.com just started, which is our, our Drupal site there in Chinese. So we just Sunday. got that off the ground. And yeah, we're really starting to see people come out of the woodwork and, and pick this up and, and start contributing back to the core of Drupal as well. We're starting to see Chinese people contribute. Is it... Uh, I mean, because the government is so involved, is it diff can they just put their own sites up, or do they have to get approval? Do they have to get a license? Yeah, to run a server, you need a license. And it's kind of like a driver's license, where they don't necessarily audit what you're going to put on the server, but they just want to know who run who's running servers, how they can get in touch with them if they don't like what they see. Right. And so, yeah, you do need to register. Do you get the sense that there's a lot of censorship going on, or no? Uh, well, there is the Great Firewall of China. So, you know, um, all the hosted services that we use over here, like Blogspot, WordPress.com, Wikipedia, all these things are blocked. They just, can't use them. They're blocked outright, yeah, at the firewall level. So you can't access those sites whatsoever in China. Uh -huh. Now, there's a Chinese alternative to each one of those. So there's hosted blogging services that are in China, but they're registered with the government. And That's the difference. So I, could, you see, I understand now, a dissident could go to WordPress.com, start a blog, the Chinese government would have no control over it. That's right. This way, they control the server. So if a dissident starts a blog in China, That's right. they could shut it down yeah. right away if they need to. Yeah. So uh, let's take a little bit of a uh, look. This is the Drupal China site. Yeah, this is a uh, That's Drupal, so cool. Drupal, Drupal China site. Um, it looks just like the Drupal uh, World site, yeah. except that it's in Chinese. Yeah. Uh, and Drupal's good at that. It handles, uh, you know, Chinese characters and um, Russian characters, Arabic characters and stuff. Um, yeah, we're seeing a lot of developers spring up, a real community forming, um, sites being launched on Drupal in Chinese. Are they, are they doing the same kind of Web 2.0 conferences that we see here, like the pun conferences, the bar camps? Well, um, we, right after we planned Bar Camp Vancouver, we took our first trip to China last year, and we decided to just take the, the model from Bar Camp Vancouver and export it over to Shanghai. So last year we did the first Bar Camp in uh, in, in China, it was oh, in Shanghai. Fun. It went great. How we many people? 120 people the wow. first time and 200 the second time. Wow. We well, Describe for people who don't know what a bar camp is, what kind of the uh, organization. The real works. basics are instead of having a, uh, a speaker and then a bunch of uh, attendees who passively sit around and listen, you have just a bunch of participants. There they all so, are. That's yeah, so neat. Yeah, that's uh, Bar Camp Shanghai 2007. Um, so so it's, a, it's a true conference in the sense everybody's conferring with everybody, everybody's talking to everybody. Yeah, except that instead of uh, them having a speaker and then a passive audience, everyone's expected to participate. So that. whether you share information or blog about the event or help right. with setup and clean up, everyone contributes. Everyone brings what they're passionate about and talks and shares and stuff. So. It, it seems to fit their culture, I think, pretty well. They, they get that idea, it right? It's pretty well. The, commun and, the com communal yeah. spirit uh, the, the, of, of participating, of building a society together. I think that's great. The yeah. best thing has been seeing it take off now that we've left. We, we organized three bar camps on our own, but now since we've left, we've been invited to Web 2.0 camp in China, Urban Camp in China, which is like the future of Chinese cities, people getting together oh, to talk cool. about future China cities in the unconference style. So, so they've really uh, jumped on this. They really yeah, get it's it. It's great. There's, yeah. a, there's definitely an appetite for it. So, Is there any input from the Chinese government when you do these kinds of things? We haven't encountered them directly yet. I mean, we've done all of our, our standard things, like when we put up a server for um, like, here's the Bar Camp Beijing site. We had to get a license to just right. run the server. And, and the Bar Camp Shanghai site, we had to get a license to do that. We've registered our business there because we're going to be opening up shop and done a, a joint venture with a Chinese company to help uh, get over the foreign ownership restrictions right. and things. But Now, Yahoo and Google have run up against a buzzsaw yeah. when it comes to interacting with China, and particularly uh, Yahoo because uh, they turned over information about a Chinese dissident to the Chinese government. The dissident got arrested. That's Are you right. concerned about doing business in China? at that level? Do you worry about that kind of thing? There are some concerns, but I actually think that things that we're doing are, are empowering Chinese people to kind of take uh, take some of that power. You know, blogging, personal publishing, yeah. social software, these are really empowering uh, things for individuals. It's so. actually a little subversive. I mean, yeah, the whole idea is you know, exactly. Empower the individual. Give the individual voice. I understand that some of the members of the Chinese government may not like the idea. Yeah. But in the long run, if you do this slowly, like rainwater, it can actually right. transform a society. One it's transforming the, our society. Yeah. One of the most telling things is if you go into a Google image search outside of China for Tiananmen Square, you see the tank man standing yeah, in front of the tank. See that in China. Fifteen out of the top twenty photos on Google image search right. are the tank man in Tiananmen Square. Right. You do the same Google search in China, and you see zero. In fact, yeah. you can't find it whatsoever. Yeah. It's as if it didn't happen. They're very sensitive 
sensitive. I understand they're sensitive about it. I'd be sensitive about it too. But I think you're doing exactly the right thing, which is bringing these tools to the Chinese people. It gives them a voice, and and ultimately, this is the kind of stuff that can really transform. Here's a picture of the offices of the new Rain City office. No, that's is, not. Yeah, this is the, is the it? hallway, and we we rented a six floor, Look at that. floor that's a, office in that's a, a, a an Chinese an, alley. There's the remen, remains of an old Mao poster. That's right. There yeah, it's beautiful. Down. Did you take um, that picture? Yeah, I took that. That picture. is a beautiful shot. Yeah. So we're we're opening wow. it up right now. We've hired our first five employees in China. Uh, Robert Scales moved there last week, and he'll be there for a year. Does he speak uh, Chinese? We're, we have a, a Chinese tutor coming to deal with uh, five great. employees at our company, and That's also neat. over there with Scales. And as well. you're employing Chinese people as well. That's right. Every, everyone in China is Chinese. They're local. Um, yeah, yeah, everyone's local. And That's really neat. Chris yeah. Krug is a great photographer, as you can see. That is a Thanks, beautiful Leo. shot. What a shot. And also a great developer, and, and I think making a big difference in China. I think this is the way you do it. Grassroots, empower the people, yeah. give them a chance to have a voice. RainCityStudios.com for more information and uh, DrupalChina.com. And uh, we have all the uh, links on our website, LabWithLeo.com. Thanks Chris, a lot. It's great to see you. That's, see you that's exciting. It's really neat to see that. More of your calls coming up when the lab continues. You stay right here. Welcome back to the lab with Leo. I'm Kate Abraham, and now it's time for my tip of the day. This is a fantastic site. It's a social documentary site called Media Storm, and what it does, it takes different documentaries from people all over the world and tells their stories. Fantastic site. As you can see, it's a very slick site to use, and the cool thing is, is that, um, the projects they are photojournalism, they're interactivity, and they are audio and video projects. There are huge amounts of submissions. You could spend hours watching and reading and listening. It's just a beautiful, beautiful site. And the very cool thing is it actually won an Emmy this year for broadband documentaries. Oh, neat. Who's behind it? Do you know? It's actually a journalist. I can tell you. Media Storm. It really looks like a very interesting site. It's such site. a beautiful site. It's one of those sites as well where it, it's almost like CNN, but the kind of social compassion right. side of CNN. Right. You know? It's that kind of slick Well, I, you know, and what we just saw with Chris, I think what's really exciting about this technology is it ultimately is a little bit subversive. It yeah. really gives everybody a voice. Mm -hmm. Some people you don't want to hear from, but that's part yeah. of it is that everybody has a voice. And even if, for instance, you're a documentarian and you can't get your documentaries on, on, on network television, you can always put it on the Internet Absolutely. and reach a worldwide audience. You know, and a lot of these, they are so well made. They yeah, really of course are. they are. They're, they're great. Fantastic. They're well made. There's great people out there doing yeah. amazing stuff. This just gives us access to them. Absolutely. That's what's really exciting. Yeah, this is mediastorm.org. Great site. Thank you, Fantastic Kate. Fantastic site. Now, I think we have a caller. We do indeed. We're going to Ottawa in Ontario, and we're going to talk to Roseanne. Oh, hello, Roseanne. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm great. Welcome to the show. What, are, what is that you're holding up? Repairing and upgrading your PC. Digital <laughs> scrapbook. You've got a few books there. Yeah, I'm kind of a bookaholic when it comes to computers. You have <laughs> Outlook, Windows. I, I don't know what that dig is, but anyway, you've got quite a few books there. Well, I'm glad. So uh, I guess, Roseanne, you are uh, you are officially a geek then, yes? I, I'm, in, I'm a geek in training. Oh, yeah. Well, we all are in that sense. Well, what can I do for you? Well, I was hoping you'd be able to tell me how I can go about embedding a music file in a PowerPoint presentation without... Um, bloating the file out of proportion so yeah. it still stays a reasonable size and also so that I don't have to have a separate um, MP3 file within a folder with the PowerPoint presentation. Well, okay, that's your choice. The, okay, so you have two ways of putting, bringing music to a PowerPoint presentation. One is linking which means you'll have to have the MP3 or WAV file with the, with the PowerPoint. The other is embedding which means basically it's the same thing, it just sticks it into the file. So, but you have to have the music there in one form or the other, either linked or embedded. Right. You can't just give somebody a presentation and say, you know, the music will come in magically. I guess it could come in over the net. Um, you could probably do that. If you, if you linked to a sound that was on the Internet, it could play that. Uh, but then they'd have to have network access to see the PowerPoint presentation. Right. So the way you, t you, the way you could tell PowerPoint whether to link or embed... It, you'd think they'd have an explicit way to do it, and there isn't. Um, if it's an MP3, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and maybe, I don't know about Office 2007, but up to now, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't embed an MP3. It would only link it. You'd have to have it in a folder. Okay. Uh, you can go into the options settings of PowerPoint and say, link files 
that are greater than a certain size. In other words, I don't want my PowerPoint file to get too bloated, so if the, if the music file is greater than a megabyte, link to it instead of embedding it. So if you set that number low, if you say only, you know, you, if it's anything over 1K, link to it, it'll link to everything. It won't embed any of it in the file. Okay. Now, if you want to reduce the size of your, it sounds like what you want to do is reduce the size of your folders or files that you're sending along. I was hoping to, but I guess what, the priority is that if somebody doesn't have that particular music file, they still be able to play it and hear the music. So. Well, you have to either give it to them or embed it into the PowerPoint. So I guess embedding is my... Uh, yeah, and what I would suggest is you, there are ways to make those files smaller. Use MIDI's instead of Waves. MIDI's are very small, they sound a little cheesy, and you can't control what they're going to sound like. It depends on the MIDI playback device that that person's using. So some, on some machines it'll sound great, and some machines it'll sound like... I so, didn't think that MIDI files were compatible with... Um, uh, I think you can, I'll have to look and see, but I think you can embed MIDI files. You can also make smaller MP3's, but then you're going to reduce the sound quality, right? Right. And MP3's do not embed, they only link. Okay. So what, in that case, what you do is you zip it all up into one file, and they unzip it. Almost everybody can unzip, and it'll unzip into a folder. And when they play the PowerPoint, the, the MP3 will be in that folder. And if you make those 32, kilo, kilobit, 32 kilobit per second mono MP3s, they're going to be pretty small. What are you making? Uh, what am I making? In, like one yeah, what, what, what is this for? I actually teach a PowerPoint class. Oh, well, you're asking me. You're the expert. <laughs> Not yet. I'm pretty sure. Now, uh, it may be a hack to get these. I'll, I'm going to see if I can figure this out. I'm, I, I, it may be a hack to get MIDI files into uh, PowerPoints, but that would certainly be the smallest kind. Again, you don't have a lot of control over it, and you couldn't have singing. It would only be an instrumental, right? Right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to do some research. It was my understanding that you could, but you're the teacher. You would know better than I. I'm still new at this. <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're all learning. Are you talking about Office 2007? No, I'm actually still teaching 2003. Uh, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Um, oh, yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, in fact, I think the music tracks that come with PowerPoint are MIDI. So I'm pretty sure that you can embed MIDI. It may not be the most obvious way to do it. Um, and, uh, and the problem with MIDI, as I said, is you, you can't predict what it's going to sound like, and you can't get singing in, you can't get real music. It would just be instrumental versions of the songs. You know, Daisy, Daisy, played on a synthesizer in the computer. Right. So that's why MP3s are probably preferable. They can be the smallest of, of, uh, of any good quality music file. Okay. Hey, it sounds like that's neat. Where do you teach? Um, in uh, Rockland, Ontario. That's great. At a, at a uh, extension class, junior college? It's an adult education center. Adult education. It's a great thing to learn. PowerPoint's so useful for everybody. Even kids can use it in, in schools to do their presentations. My daughter uses it for her presentations. It's great in high school. Thanks, Roseanne. Great to talk to you. Have a great day, Leo. You too. Thanks a lot. I'll take a look at this MIDI thing. I'm pretty sure, but I, I may be wrong that you could put MIDI's. PowerPoint. Another thing too, uh, Craig Severson did a segment on how to do better presentations. We, have, we have some great. We have that's uh, online, and it's on our show. Uh, it's our show notes. The video's up there. So, yeah, yeah. So go to uh, livewithleo.com, and, and yeah. you know, I don't know if everybody knows this, but all of our guest segments are on on the website. They, they are. They are. So when we have somebody like Chris Krug in, or Craig Severson, or uh, Rick Yeager, you can go to the website livewithleo.com and watch that segment. We can't put the whole show up there. No, but those segments we can. Yeah, show yeah. notes as well. Thanks for reminding me about that. Oh, yeah, 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 no problem. Yeah. So those Greg Seversons are fantastic. So the free file, free file. Yule's Jewel. Yule's Today Jewel. we're rocking the windows. It's okay. called Dazzling Events. That's the name of the program. Dazzling. And what it is, it's an event schedule for Windows. Okay. So first thing you do is you can add an event and you can choose the frequency. So you can choose from, do I want to make this event just once? Mm -hmm. Hourly? Daily? So it's really powerful. It's really simple. So let's just say weekly. You know, you can choose what days you want this event to happen. And then the power comes from actually choosing the actions. So what kinds of actions? So right here we go. CD, play an MP3. Play an MP3, do a reminder. 
long connect clock. dial up. Of course, launching applications, oh, shutting down. Oh. It can also um, f can also do things like a lot shut down and start services. And the services, I mean, you're talking like things that are actually running in wow. Windows. So it's really powerful. You could even powerful. put a batch file and have it run a series of commands. Exactly. And, and um, a, a viewer sent this in. And they said what they do is they check their external IP and then post it to their blog. So at any given time, every hour, it tells what the IP address wow. so they can access their computer from. So home. this will run over and over and over it'll, again as long as you've got As long as you've got Dazzling Events running, it'll do any single, you can have multiple, like you can have hundreds of events happening oh, hourly, really daily, it's once. It's like a cron job yeah. for the Unix types out there. There you go. So dazzling Events. Dazzling Events it's for dazzling Windows. Events. It is. How much is that? It's uh, it's about as much as you'll pay for any other Yule's Jewel. Nothing. Free! free. They're all free! That's Absolutely the beauty of it! Free. Free, free, and where free. do we go to find those? Labwithleo.com. Go to Yule's Jewels, free files. There's this, there's more, more to come. Always there. Great stuff. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm actually going to use that one. That's very handy. All right, coming up in just a bit, Sean Carruthers. He's got some really interesting devices that allow you to stream your media throughout the house. And you, woo, the TV show goes like, woo, like that, right through that. Woo. Is that right. That's a technical explanation. That's it, exactly okay. how it works. Okay, I'm glad. Many people don't understand that. I'm impressed that you do. That's the technical. There you go. This is a quiz question today. What do they call OS 9 before they put it out? In beta, as we say in the business, was it Sonata, Allegro, Tempo, or Leopard? Hmm. Think about it. We'll tell you when the laugh continues. Stay right here. Welcome back to the lab. Before the break, we asked you what Mac <clears throat> OS 9 was called. I think it was Sonata. That's my guess. Yes. It's not a car. <laughs> well, it is, but that was later. OS 9, well, that was, uh, that was under Gil Emilio. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were using musical terms then. And Steve Jobs came, fired everybody, and now it's Big Cats. So let's talk. Sean Carruthers is here, our gadget guy, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, transferring media, not just through your home's airwaves, but through the Internet as well. Yes. Very cool. Yeah, I love this. Uh, the, the fact that uh, we've had media streaming uh, from your home computer to uh, your TV for a while now, a few years. It, it hasn't been all that great in the past. It's, it's getting a lot better. But now we, we have this ability to actually stream from your TV back to your computer, no matter where your computer now that's, is. That's confusing. But why would I want to stream from my TV to my computer? Well, let's just say that uh, you're uh, here in Vancouver I taking am. the lab with Leo. I am. And you've got a, a local TV channel back home in uh, in California. That the you San want Francisco see. Giants, for instance, or exactly. the 49ers, you and they're not on here. See it here. So I could watch them on the internet right. from my you can cable box at home on the internet. That's what this does. At home. Right. So uh, this right here is the Slingbox Solo. It's a new iteration of this uh, device well, from Sling. Why do they call it Solo? Um, you know, I'm not 100% sure. Is it all alone? Why is it any different than the old Slingbox? Uh, it is different. It's got a, a newer design. It uh, will stream much prettier. HD. Um, oh, wow. It does have a, a few uh, different inputs on the back, so I'm not 100% sure why. Uh, why be, there's a pro version and there's a solo version, so this is probably okay. Just a, a Maybe it doesn't have end. HDMI or something. This does yeah. have component inputs, though. It does have the standard components. composite inputs. So you'd hook up your cable box or your DVD player or mm -hmm. your DVR to this, right? And then hook up the internet, right, to it, and then what? And then uh, what you do is you uh, set it up on the same home network as one of your computers, so a notebook okay. computer. And uh, then you would set up a client on your computer, which will ah, then pull so the information. So you need to be running some software at home as right. well. You need okay. to be running some software on the computer. Okay. So what it'll then do is it'll take whatever your Slingbox is seeing and stream it over the network, whether it's local or across the country or continent, and stream it to the client on your computer. So when I'm running the laptop uh, in my hotel room, I'm connecting to my laptop at my house. No, no, you're connecting. I'm connecting to, to the, the sling box. box through okay. the network, right? So Got you don't it. need to set any other computer up at home. To Can I shut up the computer at home? Shut down the computer? Oh, I don't use a computer. You don't at home. need a computer. At okay, all. that's what I got confused yeah. about. All you need to do is it. make sure that your equipment is uh, turned on or ready to be turned on using the sling boxes. The, the, the uh, DVD and the DVR. Right. And, all and all you're stuff. holding uh, one of the keys in your hand. Those are the little IR sensors uh, that uh, will actually transmit the data to your devices. So, you so you'll hang this over the cable box and the light and this will, will go to the remote control part of the cable box. They right. give you two. 
Yeah, you can uh, control two devices with that. Okay. So um, we've actually got it running here. Matt uh, has. Uh, he's running it from his house. Yeah, he's got one he's of these. He's got all at the home Bruins well. games on at home. He's got the Bruins games. So he actually is a huge Bruins fan, and he was listening to them on the internet. And, I was uh, joking about the Bruins. <laughs> no, he really does. Look at really that. He really does. So right now we've uh, got uh, G4 Tech TV running. I'm not sure why it says CNN in the background. I guess they're doing ah, the feed. So um, we've got this running live right now. Um, it looks and, like it's uh, a, so this is running over the internet. This is running over the internet. It, there's a little bit of a lag here, so it's not 100% live. So we can click on my DVR here, and, uh, and there's actually, a little hesitation and stuttering. Yeah. That's as it's catching up. Yeah, pretty much. But it looks. Does it? Would you say it looks as good as a home? Oops. Whoops. Oh, so there, there we, we go. Full screen, full screen. And then we're going to hit, I guess, OK, and then uh, the lab, which was record. And this is going now to the DVR. Right. So we're going to hit OK one more time. That's going to bring it from the little thumbnail to the full screen. One more time. One more time. There we go. Wow, there's Alex so, Lindsay. So this is streaming off of his DVR. Right, so we're playing something back now that he's previously recorded. So you can do this with the Over DVD the public player. internet. Over the public internet. And he said it's, it's stuttering a little bit, and you have to have the network at home to sort of deal with this. If you've got a really choked off uh, upstream uh, connection, right. then this may not work it's as like good. It's like any streaming video on the net. It's totally dependent on what net connection you have at the hotel, what connection mm -hmm. you have at home, what's going on that day on the internet. Right. But you can at least do this. and you can. Mm -hmm. I, so that remote control controls... Your set top box using these little infrared things. Right, and using it to so see. So I'm controlling here. them from You're controlling the hotel room. From wherever you happen wow, to be, that's wherever wild. you have a connection. So okay, that's the, that's the solo. These are the turbos. What do these do? Essentially, if you, uh, it requires a wired Ethernet connection. The turbo essentially is uh, power line networking that you can buy for about uh, 90 bucks. The, so this the, goes with a sling box. Right, so you buy this as an option if, you're not, if you don't have an Ethernet connection directly beside your This will give TV you access to your TV set where, where the are. sling box so lives. Plug, okay. plug one of these into your uh, router and plug the other one into beside your home network Got it. or your home okay. theater setup. Okay. How much is how much are these devices here? Uh, those devices there are eighty dollars. The sling box is about one hundred and eighty. Okay, great. And there's no subscription fees. There's no there's no monthly fee or anything. No. You just pay that. Now there's other companies doing similar things. Uh, this one is Netgears. This right here is actually the MediaGate. So it's a Korean company. It uh, it's sort of a do-it-yourself enthusiast kind of uh, setup. You actually put your own hard drive into this. You just open up the side panel, and then you can actually move content over to this by so it has using the USB connectors. Connection. Right, you so move you, content over to it, mm -hmm. put it on the hard drive, and then you watch it over the internet? And then you watch it, uh, you don't watch this over the internet. This is actually just streaming from your computer to this. You can either stream or you can load things directly onto the hard drive inside. See, so it's kind of like the Apple TV. You can either stream this, or play from the internet. This sits next to my television set. Right. I play the TV off of the hard drive in here, or it can stream from my computer right. either way, like an Apple TV. But it plays probably more formats, yes, DivX and M uh, WMV yeah, it, it, and all of those. It's enthusiast, so it'll play all of those different things. And I said it will stream either over wireless, which we have the antenna for here, or it'll do it over Ethernet. How much is that? That one right there is um, about two hundred and twenty. We don't have time to show the D-Link no, product. We'll same idea, though, time. right? Same, same uh, thing. So there are other. This is this is a big category. It's really yeah. taken off. Heck, Sling was supposed to make something like this and it hasn't yet. We're waiting for that special whatever it was called. I'm anxious. At some to. point, Sling Media Player or something like that. Well, anyway, if you want more information, labwithleo.com. We've got all the details there. A final word coming up right after this. <laughs> back to the lab. So Matt Harris, our, uh, our senior producer who apparently uses this, explains that this is a solo because you can only hook up one unit. Yes. A cable box or a mm -hmm. DVR or a high, uh, HD DVD player or but then they have the, the, the pro version which, which allows you up to four. four yeah. yeah. So that's the difference. So this is this is less expensive because yeah. it's only one at a yeah. time. So multiple inputs but you can only use one of them at a time. Oh, now I'm confused again. <laughs> so you can hook up a bunch of stuff, but you can only watch one at a time? Yeah, you have your choice. Well, who's watching two at a time? No, you, you just choose one at a time. That's all. I don't understand. He's very happy See, with the way Read the manual. <laughs> He's very happy with that. He gets to watch his Bruins Matt at loves 4 o'clock Pacific time. He's yeah, very he happy. He can watch the, the Red Sox, the Bruins. Yeah. Does he, is, is there, are there other Boston teams that He's he likes? A Patriots fan as well. It's, it's kind of inexplicable. He's, he's from Toronto. I don't get it. Anyway, we're almost out of time. We do want to remind you that if you want to be on the show, all you got to do is go to our website, labwithleo.com. Kate will call you. I She's will. very professional. And we'll put very you on polite. the show. Very polite. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>